Hello everyone, welcome to problem 3.13 of data driven selection dynamics. So we are going to be starting the section of separation of variables. I've currently skipped over the, uh, there's the boundary conditions in Mignus theorem section, which has about two problems. And then there's the, the method of images section that has, uh, I don't know, maybe like six problems or so in it. But um, I'm currently going to be skipping over that section for now. Uh, if you guys really do want me to cover it at a later point, um, you know, just request it in the comments below. If I get enough requests and enough uh, people warning those problems, I will record them. But I really enjoy doing Laplace's equation problems and I really like the separation of variables section and kind of the rest of chapter three. So I'm just, I kind of just want to skip to this stuff. Um, so yeah, that's really where we're going to be starting. So. This problem, let me get the, uh, the problem statement. It says to find the potential in the infinite slot of example 3.3. So if you have your textbook, go and look at example 3.3. Uh, read through it if you haven't. Um, but it says if the boundary at x equals zero, so our axes are x, uh, y is actually the vertical, and z is coming out of the board. And it says if if, it, if the boundary here consists of two metal strips where the potential on between, um, so the length of the strip here, the height here, not the length, but the height of the strip is A. So from Y equals zero to Y equals A. And it, at the halfway point at Y equals A over two there is the, the boundary of the second strip. So it's just made up of uh, two strips from Y equals zero to A over two, and from A over two to A. and the potential on the bottom half of that strip is V naught, and the potential on the top half of that strip is minus V naught. And the rest of the problem set up is the same. So the two conducting surfaces here are, uh, are grounded and they're infinite um, in the X and Z directions, but obviously I just cut them off at some point. Um, and yeah, that should really be it. We just need to find what the potential is. So I'm gonna put the textbook down. So if you have read through the beginning um, section of the separation of variable section for David Griffiths, uh, he goes through and actually solves Laplace's equation and, and Cartesian coordinates in two dimensions here. Um, and so he, he ends up with this solution, um, a general solution uh, the potential as a function of x and y is equal to the summation of from n equals 1 to infinity of a co some coefficient c sub n and this coefficient depends on you know what value of n we're at times the exponential uh, e to the minus n pi x divided by a times the sine of n pi y divided by a and then he goes and shows you how to figure out what the expression is for each of these coefficients for each value of n. So for each value of n, the coefficient is equal to two divided by a um, times the integral from zero to a, where remember a is our boundary um, height here. And so we're integrating the potential function um, as a function of y here, um, uh, that which is given to us. So uh, I kind of expressed it up here. So from y, um, between y equals zero and a over two, the potential is v naught, and between y over two and a, the potential is minus v naught. So we're integrating this potential function times the sine of n pi y over a with respect to y. Um, so if you don't know where these came from, I suggest you actually read David Griffith's book and he actually goes to the full solution of, of how you develop these solutions. So we basically just have Laplace as a point of the solution. We just apply our specific boundary conditions to the solutions. So what we need to do is figure out what our coefficients are. So let's do this integral. So plugging in, we have two, two divided by a, and then our potential function is a piecewise function so you know it's split up into two different values depending on the range so our integral is going to be split instead of zero to a we split it into two integrals so we have an integral from zero to a over two and that integral this is v naught 
in both integrals, um, you know, you have v naught. One is positive, one is minus v naught. But I just factor out the v naught out of the equation, and it just sits outside with the constants because v naught is a constant. But the first integral is zero to a over two sine of n pi y over a dy, and then we have the minus sign because of this. We have minus sine uh, the integral from a over two to a times uh, uh, integral sine of n pi y divided by a dy. So just doing these two integrals, it's super simple. Integral sine is negative cosine, so we have our constants. We then evaluate the integrals, so that's that times these. So we have minus cosine of n pi y over a, and then divided by n pi over a. That's just how integration of uh, the trig functions work. And we evaluate that from zero to a over two. Then we have plus sine, because the integral of sine is negative sine, so the negatives become a plus, and we get cosine of n pi y over a, all over n pi over a, and that's evaluated from a over two to a. So we now have our constants multiplied by, um, you know, plugging in the bounds. So a over two, here, if you plug in a over two for y, you get n pi over two, so you just have minus cosine n pi over two. Also, I factored out the n pi's and pulled them out, because those are constants, and the a's just get canceled um, by plugging in. Um, uh, actually, oh yeah, by by these a's go to the top, but there's already an a out here, so those a's get moved to the top and cancel out. So that's why the a's go away. So we just have minus cosine of n pi over two plus cosine of zero when we plug in zero there. Then for the second term, we have plus cosine of n pi when we plug in a, the a's cancel. And then minus cosine of n pi over two when we plug in a over two for y. And of course the n pi is factored out, the a is canceled on the bottom there. So just plugging in this stuff, we have the constants to v naught over n pi times, so cosine of zero is one. I just moved that here. Now, um, cosine of n pi over two is zero because, well, actually, no, it's not zero. Let me rephrase that. These two terms are moved to the back. So I have minus two cosine n pi over two. We'll discuss what this becomes. But, and then we have cosine of n pi. So cosine of n pi depends on what the value of n is, and n is just an integer. So if cosine is zero, then you get one. If cosine is, if n is one, then you get cosine of pi, which is negative one. If n is two, you get cosine of two pi, which is one. If you get uh, n is three, you get cosine of three pi, which is negative one. So it just keeps alternating between one and negative one, depending on what the value of n is. So you can just express that as negative one to the nth power and um, that works because if n is zero, you get anything to the zero power of one. If n is one, you get negative one. If n is two, you get um, negative one squared, which is one, and so on. So um, that's just an, a convenient way to express cosine of n pi as just negative one to the nth power. And then of course we combine those two terms as negative two cosine of n pi over two. So I just kind of wrapped this term here as gamma um, and if you see like if n is odd really if th this this term only equals a value at certain values of n and for everything else it's going to be zero so if you just start plugging in values of n so if n equals one you'll get gamma equals zero this whole term equals zero if n is two though you'll actually get four if n is three you get gamma equals zero if n is four gamma equals zero. If n is five, gamma equals zero. And it's not until you get to n equals a six that you find that this term becomes four again. So if you kept plugging in values of n and calculating it, you would find that you only get a value, and it's the same value, it's four, for n equal to two, n equal to six, n equal to 10, n equal to 14, and so on. So you can see the pattern here, um, starting at two, it's every other four values, that's when you get a value for gamma there. 
and it's the same value of 4. So we can kind of take advantage of that and express um, our summation in a cleaner way um, when we get to that. So our coefficient c sub n, um, when, so when we do have a value, so when, when, when n is not 0 and it equals 4, we just get, you know, if this is 4, then we get 4 times 2, which is 8 v naught over n pi. So our coefficient is 8 v naught over n pi when n is equal to 2, 6, 10, 14, etc. Any of those values and so on following the pattern. And our coefficient is 0 for n equal to anything else. So that's our coefficient. We can then plug that into our solution. So we get 8 v naught over pi, leaving the n inside the summation. So now we're summing over n equal to 2, 6, 10, 14, etc. While that's not a, a super clean way to express your index for your summation, it, it works for now. So we have the 1 over n from here inside the summation, and then we just have e to the minus n pi x over a times sine of n pi y over a. And so that's our solution. Um, it works. You can leave it like that. But if you want to get your summation index to be kind of neat, then you kind of just have to be clever and think of a way to express the values of n here, how to express n so that uh, in, in terms of some other index, so that you only get these values for each index. So we know that we want the value when, when, when our initial index is zero, we want our value to be two, right? So let's just say our index is j, our new index is j, like I, I've chosen here. I'm just trying to explain how, I, how my thought process here. We want, when j equals a zero, when our new index is zero, we want our, our, you know, we want this n to be two because that's, two is the first value that we get a valid solution for, where our coefficient is not zero. And for every value after that, we just want to add a multiple of four. So for each index j, we just add four times j. So for each index j, we're just adding, you know, a multiple of four to two, and that should give us a valid a, uh, a valid solution um, in our summation for our for our solution. So that's kind of how I came up with that. So essentially, I just replaced n here with this index j and just summed it from zero to infinity, and I replaced n with four j plus two. Um, and so for each value j, we still have a valid solution uh, or a valid piece of some like a valid summation. Um, no zeros in our summation, I guess. So, which it doesn't matter if you had zeros in the summation. I guess you could sum from n equals zero to infinity, but you know some of those terms would be zero. So this is a cleaner way to express it. So that's really it. That's our solution. And yeah, if you guys have any questions on how how this was solved, let me know in the comments below. And I will see you guys on problem three point fourteen.